Good afternoon, good afternoon, everybody, good afternoon. My name is Sandilin Gidi. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this seminar, our second in the year. It's a series of seminars where we discuss books, uh, new books, uh, and books that are really topical on various subjects, even if they're not that much new. Uh, we're here at Huma Institute for Humanities in Africa uh, at the University of Cape Town. Uh, I would like to thank everybody. Thank uh, uh, my dear brother, our director, uh, Divine Fu, uh, different colleagues uh, who are here who have made this day possible. Thank you, thank you so much. But also, this is a very special occasion for us because we're also co-hosting a wonderful guest from the Africa Charter Initiative, a bold charter to try and transform the imperatives that inform research production, knowledge production on this continent, and how that uh, knowledge production through research, uh, you know, meets with knowledge uh, produced from other parts of the world. So you're yeah, welcome, uh, colleagues, uh, those who are here and those who are with us online. Uh, thank you so much. Without further ado, I would like to introduce uh, the topic of today, which is basically native merchants, the building of the black business class in South Africa. This is the book that we're launching uh, uh, today. And um, we're launching it today, really, uh, not because it is new, but because the subject, uh, it covers the different subjects, uh, themes they covered are still as relevant as they were a few years ago when it, it got published. On my far right is the author, a beautiful brother I've known for many years, a uh, journalist, uh, corporate communication specialist, a uh, historian, uh, Paramisa Nzamela, ah, Nongos. You're welcome, my brother. Uh, he's currently at Stellenbosch University in the history department, pursuing, uh, you know, um, further research. Uh, so welcome. Uh, he'll tell us more about himself as the day goes by. Uh, on my immediate right is uh, my teacher, Atambile Masola. You know, Umamtuina. Uh, <laughs> She's my teacher, really, you know, because I'm a, I'm a student, I'm a history student here at UCT, and she's in the history department uh, where she's a lecturer, and she has taken me on some beautiful uh, modules in the past, and I continue uh, to learn from her. She's also a poet. Uh, I'm an aspirant poet, some, as some of you might know, so I'm learning from her as well, uh, from that front. So thank you very much, and uh, uh, let us not waste any time. Uh, the way we're going to do this is that we're going to allow our brother to read uh, from his work. This work took almost 10 years, if I'm not mistaken, uh, for him to finish. And some uh, leading figures, uh, like, uh, I mean, historians like Colin Bundy, The Rise and Fall of the African Peasantry, eh? that was his seminal work. I remember in the 80s, we used to treasure that work. We still do. So, uh, Paramesa has returned to a very, very rich and diverse archive of historiography where he looks at uh, different epochs of uh, entrepreneurship in the black community. Very few of us will appreciate the fact that, uh, uh, you know, there was, there was a stage where people in Mapungu were, were involved in, in mining in parts of KwaZulu Natal, in parts of the Free State, but he also brings other more recent uh, 20th century uh, figures. Uh, you know, it's a beautiful historical work, very, de very, 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 very expansive. Uh, and it also touches on how uh, entrepreneurship has always, uh, you know, been meshed with, with politics, entangled with politics across the ages. Uh, it's interesting, for instance, who discovered, you know, uh, Diamonds, who discovered iron ore, you know. But anyway, uh, he's going to tell us more. Uh, Mueli Skoda, a famous journalist uh, in the 80s, also did work that is very much 
uh, aligned, uh, I mean, very much, you know, uh, exemplary uh, in the work that my dear brother has put together here. Anyway, over to you, Paramesa, you read, uh, and then after that, uh, my dear sister, Atambile, uh, will pose a few questions, and the aim is to engage so that uh, our members, uh, our audience members also participate. Thank you very much. Over to you, my brother. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you, Matamela, uh, for really agreeing to host me today. Thank you to Huma for agreeing. Thank you to everybody who has sacrificed all that they could have done in this time to spend uh, a bit of their life with, with me today. Thank you very much. Thank you to the powers that be that have agreed to host us. Um, I'm, I'm indebted uh, to all those that I have not mentioned and uh, have mentioned. I want to start by giving context why I did this book, Native Merchants, the Building of a Black Business Class. I was sitting in a newsroom I'm a financial journalist by training. I'm a bit of myself. I was educated at Vest University. I did my humanities there, my undergrad. I actually came across in Sunday in such platforms. Um, then there was something called public deliberations. That was almost two decades ago. Um, Olela Man used to lead that platform. And I think the first time I had met him, Tongela Masilela, Caroline, you know, had come through and um, he was still alive. May so rest in peace to do a presentation. And I'm happy that such a model lives, yeah. you know, um, across the Val, wow. across the Val in the Cape. So, so well done to, to people of you. Thank you. Now I'm sitting in a newsroom and one of the editors say, you need to, you can write about companies, you can write about business. You need to write about black economic empowerment and um, <coughs> black business people. So I got a friend, we started, but as one read and as one interview, people have discovered that the levels of ignorance were at a massive surplus on my end. Um, on what constitutes black business, what constitutes patronage, what isn't patronage, what is really ethical and unethical business. And in interviewing people, um, Ryan Mulif, uh, Tabombe, many others, I got a sense that you couldn't talk about black empowerment without understanding how business people operated pre-black empowerment. Right. And that's how we got to native merchants. And then one went through the archives, researched, 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 and came through powerful and precious nuggets of um, people who did business in the 17th century. Um, we've got profiles from the 17th century here. Black people who did business in the 17th century, 18, 19 to the early 20th century. The book also has a non profile section, which is economic activity of black people. And that predates the arrival of the colonial administrators in the 17th century. Now we take it back to the Mapungube era, which is famous for, for gold production and merchanting both domestically and internationally. So black people did trade domestically and internationally pre the arrival of the colonial establishment, which formalized itself as the largest in their country. Actually, even before the Dutch East India Company, the English East India Company, right. um, which was here in the early 16th century, they had traded with black people um, along the shoreline of, of the Cape. But I decided to take it before, and the economic activity that is reported, you've got the copper mines of Musina, you've got oil, you've got gold, people who really 
mind this thing, sank shafts, you know, as black people, sank shafts using skin heights, leather skin heights, drying them, tying them hard, and sinking them using baskets, and mining the ore or whatever metal and bringing it back to the surface. And they had stoves to melt it, what you would call smelters today um, in the Libumbu um, district in, in, in the north. You also had people on what is now called Melville Gopis mm. who did um, all sorts of mining activities. I then transitioned to the colonial era because the interest of the colonialist in the mining of South Africa is the, is the diamond mining in Kimberley. And I note that um, a number of black people had been mining diamonds alongside Europeans when there was a big hive of activity in Kimberley. Black people were not playing marbles with the precious stones as as we are sometimes taught, you know, they they knew what diamonds were. And actually they traded their diamonds. Some of the people traded their diamonds for sheep and cattle because that was value for, for them. And some of the diamonds were exported through brokers by black people. And I then moved from the commodities era to then active business people who first took advantage of that commodities boom in Kimberley and on the Red Waters Rand. You see an emergence of agriculturalists who say there's going to be a bunch of people who are going to need food. So you had people transporting agricultural commodities, soft commodities, to the hard commodities industry, which is the gold and the diamond, um, all sorts of fresh produce. You had people having lodges because they knew if there's a hive of activity, there's going to be people who need some form of accommodation to sleep. You had people who had started newspapers because they knew that people are going to want to read about the economic activities of, 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 of those days. I want to take you, before I take you to, 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 to a reading, maybe I should touch on, on what was happening in the Cape. We had people who were formerly enslaved from West Africa, from Asia, who came via or through the Dutch East India Company, who bought their freedom, because if you were enslaved, the only way you could escape en enslavement was to buy your freedom. Literally work extra time for your master. If you work for a rent outside, you'd have to maybe give your master 60 cents and keep 40 cents to buy yourself out of slavery. And there were people who bought themselves out of slavery to be free people. And some of those people became business people in the 1600s. Um, some of them got free by running out or writing of what people would call coincidence today. I'm reporting to the master that someone has escaped and uh, they are the runaway slaves and they'll be given freedom for being prisoners. Um, there was also that aspect. But an amazing story is that of um, Black Maria. They had come from the Guinea section and she grew up from an enslaved family, although she spent the better part of her life in the Cape. She was called Suarte Maria or Black Maria. <laughs> and uh, her parents were the slaves of Jan van Riebeck. Now, her parents then read out other slaves who had run away and were causing havoc, and uh, they get freed. But um, anyway, she, she, she grows up in a, in, a, in a free family. She works hard, she buys a, a wine farm 
um, in what is now Camps Bay, and she farms. She had children by many men because it was her body, her rules. Right. Um, many, many European men, and none of them were wealthier than, than sure. her, actually. Um, she, she had vineyards, she had livestock, and, 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 and many things, and, and until she, she, she passed away. Unfortunately, if you had kids back then, and you are a black woman, those kids would be white. They were white. And if you are black, it was rare for you to have a white woman. Um, but some could escape. You learn from the book that um, actually what you might think is white and Africana <laughs> can also be black. Right. Um, that you could have strong melanin but still have links to Europe. Right. Or you could lack melanin, but still be West African. But I want to take you to a fascinating merchant in the Cape. Um, his name is Paul Bunini. He went to school, what, what was equivalent to what we call now adult education because he went to school late. Okay. Um, he had gone to, to, to love Dave. Um, he then trained to be a, a telegraph man. You know, those missionary schools had um, industrial sections. Yeah. And uh, later he trained to be a teacher, but he transitions from teaching. Did he teach about, says to him, um, one of the newspaper proprietors of any time, he says to him, you know, I'm already here in the colony, Victoria East, which is the Alice King area. And I see that many black people don't have accommodation. And he's already writing at that time, did he teach above? And he convinces anywhere to transition from teaching into entrepreneurship. Now, anywhere in the 1890s, he had a hotel on the market square in King Williamstown. It cost him about 2,000 pounds in the 1890s. I'm not an actuary, but you know, if you were to bring a quants analyst, I'd probably say 2,000 pounds then exceeds 20 million in, you know, in, well, in, in, today's, mm. in today's money. Mm. So when you were built this hotel, um, having used his savings, and you can imagine, this is a highly racist world. Um, who's going to give you funding? Who's going to? These are people who really worked hard. There was no black empowerment. And I'm not disparaging to black empowerment. <laughs> now, at the market square, when you did what was unheard of and unexpected from an African at the time, I'm on page 126 for those who are carrying the copy. He set up a two story hotel in 1894 at a cost of about 2,000 pounds. In describing the quality of Kuniwa's temperance hotel following its launch, the founder and editor of Imvo Zabanzun, John Tengo Chabavu, wrote on June 13, 1894, for natives, the hotel is in every sense of the term a grand hotel, consisting in all of no less than 17 compartments in the lower and upper story, of which three are large shops. To the upper story is attached magnificent balconies, the one facing Market Square having a commanding view of that public place of resort, while the two are connected with the back part of the building. The rest are dining room, sitting rooms, and bedrooms. Time was not very long ago when a native hotel was a thing deemed as beyond the practical. And natives who came to this very town for business had to put up in the bush for the night for want of accommodation. Only 10 years ago, the present writer, being friendless, had from this very cause to take into serious consideration the practicality of securing a shakedown in caves that wild beasts may have made in the banks of the buffalo. 
And from that uncanny quarter to go about his examination work, which was to extend about a week. Now, you get a sense that Jabav, who has started a newspaper, is already entrepreneurial himself. Right. Um, he is saying, chaps, I'm putting up in caves mm. with wild beasts. There are no hotels for, 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 for natives, and he convinces anywhere to, to open up. He adds, you know, the North Temperance Hotel has been built to meet a real need amongst natives. Um, he then goes on to quote what was in the Cape Agas. Now, this is Jabavi in his paper, Invo Zabanzund, citing what the Cape Agas mm. says about the Temperance Hotel. So the Temperance Hotel had received attention from the English liberal mm. Cape Agas. I'm not going to try and have a, an English accent. It's a Monday. It's a Monday. It's a Monday. But, um, you know, the Cape Agha says this is a step in the right direction. And Mr. Pliniwa's venture deserves to succeed. The lot of traveling natives is very hard. They cannot associate in comfort with white people. Indeed, hotel keepers in self-defense have to refuse them admittance to the ordinary residential portions of the house. And it is naturally hurtful to the feelings of a civilized and educated native to have to betake himself to the outbuildings. It is not everywhere that it would pay to carry on such a business as Mr. Pennyways, but it would be monstrous if it were viewed with jealousy by white people. When we are not prepared, to break down the barrier which makes it necessary. Beautiful. Beautiful. I'll leave it there. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Paramisan, Zamela. Uh, over to you, my dear sister, Atambile Masola. Thank you so much. And um, I'm just to echo um, Paramisa's gratitude. It's always great to be back at Huma, um, especially for the book launches. launches. Um, I'm going to start with an obvious question. Very obvious question. So it's native merchants. Why not black merchants or African merchants? Especially because you start with a deep history. It's, 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 it's quite interesting. Now, you, you first have to find the sexy <laughs> part of it that's going to be grabbing. But of course, that grabbing headline has got to be informed by some substance. Right. Right. Now, <clears throat> I define in the earlier part of the book, a merchant as someone who trades, right? right? Which is quite easier to, to, to handle. Um, what is a native? In English, the etymology of the term would refer to someone who grows up in a certain place and identifies that place as their home. Right. That is a native of a region. But then I further explain that there were people, because South Africa is such a complicated uh, geographical space, there were certain people who moved to certain areas and found a new home here and called it their native land. Right. So that is the, the, the genesis of, 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 of the term. Mm. Yeah. No, I mean, it's, I, I just found it very curious particularly because, yeah, you start much, much further when than the time where this word native becomes politicized sure. um, in the way that you, you, you're you describing. Um, but an alternative title I would have gone for is legislating black poverty, which is what you eventually show, right, is that there were actually laws that were put in place to make black people poor, sure. starting much, much earlier. Maybe if you could speak to a bit of that, because it's not only that you're showing the history of black business, you're also showing how impossible things were made to be impossible for people to be able to do business, which is something we think we take for granted. Um, but there's some nice examples that you include. Sure, sure. I mean, if we go to Kimberley, with the discovery of diamonds before the arrival of Cecil John Rhodes, before the arrival of Banato and the Oppenheimers, 
I said initially that black people were mining diamonds alongside black people. And they were selling these diamonds even to overseas markets. What happens? Mm. There is then a big rebellion in the beginning of the 1870s in Kimberley at the Market Square. There was a, a colonial administrator, the Saudi, uh, related to the Saudi who killed the Inza. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, now, this Saudi, Richard Saudi, um, was liberal. He says black people can mine alongside white people. But then there is a, a big market rebellion from white merchants who say it's actually very costly to buy a ticket of a ship from England or America. The natives here do not have that cost and therefore we cannot compete with them. We need to remove them. And all sorts of disparaging ways are used to remove black people. These people steal, these people, you know, they are a nuisance to the diamond mines and certain ordinances are passed that prohibit black people. Actually in Balfontein, um, over 20 black people just in the early 1870s lose their mining license, that mining license, and they lose them because of that decree. Now, this is how capitalism works. Mm. And you see it here. Capitalism cannot work outside the monopoly or oligopoly structure. The moment there's mass, it becomes a problem. The English could not face competition amongst black people. They just couldn't compete. You can think about it, they need labor and they don't have the numbers. Black people have the numbers. Obviously, they're going to produce more than them and they had to devise such mechanisms. You take it outside the commodities. Um, Richard Baloy, who was a treasurer of the South African National Native Congress, which became the African National Congress. I mean, one of the things that I tackle here is that the notion of people being in the ANC and being in business has got nothing to do with 1994. Good. People in the ANC before it was in power mm. were already driving burping V8 engines. Um, Dr. J.S. Moroka is one of them. Mm. Um, Uma had sports cars, Scott, and, yeah. you know, these guys were petite bourgeois, right? As, as, as how about the Matthews? Um, they had buses, yeah, you know, remember they are missionary educated, right? So, so black wealth has got nothing to do with the ANC ascending to power, um, as, as we are taught today by, by a certain liberal crowd, Richard Banoy as treasurer of the ANC has buses that are ferrying people between Alexandra and the central business district. Doing well, business is growing. You mean the central business district of Johannesburg? Of Johannesburg. Of thank, Johannesburg. You thank, thank you. Thank you. Of Johannesburg. Um, then one morning, new regulations are introduced in the busing system. How many people can you carry on a day? And new participants are introduced. Actually, that is how PATCO is born. Public Utility Transport Company um, with great names in there. And what the state does to disenfranchise your Richard Banu is that they subsidize the park. Right. Um, so if you get onto a park call, your ticket is going to be cheap mm. because the state is already funding it. And Richard Banu, who has buses, um, doesn't get funded. I mean, it was not just Richard Banu who suffered at fate, um, the Solans and so on, many of them. Um, because their cost of production or cost of business 
um, was just difficult to manage with, with the racist with the racist laws that were being introduced. Mm -hmm. That's 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 those are the two examples. Um, and what I like about those two examples, and you must let me know when you want to open it up. What I like about those two examples, for me, what they illuminate is that the the kind of black poverty is linked to white anxiety or black wealth and white anxiety are connected and that you can legislate around white anxiety right there's there's a whole system that you can put in place in order to mitigate against white anxiety it's almost like those legislations are put in place to make white people feel more and more comfortable um, i mean the one with the with the, the mining licenses it's, it's wild for me and these are also just like working class white people. So white people also know to like legislate across their spectrum. So they'll up legislate for the Oppenheimers to make their business easier and they'll legislate for the, the miners, the white miners. Um, but maybe to end off so that we can open, the implications of those laws obviously are felt throughout. So there's, the, there's a, a breaking point in which as much as we talk about white generational wealth, there's something that happens with black generational wealth that doesn't cross over. And I think that's where your book actually ends. Sure. And maybe if you can speak about the decision to kind of end at that point, because something happens where black generational wealth cannot continue. Sure. Because of the system that's been created. Sure. You know. Because where's the Kuniba Hotel now? Sure. You, you, you know, um, in Stellenbosch, um, who is uh, an authority on African history and Africana economic history. They concede, and many of them, that the notion of a black proletariat didn't exist. Right? That black people didn't sell their labor. Hmm. They it was forced. They, it was forced, right? Now, if you introduce such ordinances and exclude them from mining diamonds, hmm. What happens? They are then forced to work, right? And they have to sell their labor. Now, there are a number of things that were done that forced people, black people, out of business and out of their homelands to come to the central business districts. Um, what I call the real black tax, hard tax. Right. You do not have money. Now you have to pay tax for every hut that you occupy. That forces you to go and sell labor. You get to the business district. You start a washing concern like Amawasha. Yeah. Of, of Zululand. Yeah. You know, because they see that the gold mining environment is full of men who can't wash themselves. You know, English in particular. Um, <clears throat> And the Zulu, Amazon, then take advantage of that. And they wash the clothes of the Englishman and they run a, a cleaning service. But in doing that, legislation is introduced. They are told, don't wash on the Bramfantin River. Go and wash across the Clip Sprit in Soweto. Your cost of accessing your clients, something. All of, all of a sudden, they can't operate and they have to move back to the homelands. When they get to the homelands, they are told you have to pay tax. They then have to move to the city and sell their labor. Those laws, number one, introduced a black proletariat culture amongst black people. All of a sudden, black people had to sell their labor when they didn't need to sell their labor. Now, here's a nuance in all of this, because you could work hard and be smart and be a clerk like Saul Blackie mm -hmm. or Isaiah Van Bele, mm -hmm. you know, and have a nice house in Kimberley or in Soweto in Alexandria, mm -hmm. right? There's a hard worker trying to be resilient, but here's a nuance of what this thing does. It fragments us as Black people. Hmm. All of a sudden, there are no opportunities in the homelands, the opportunities are in the commercial district. You now, as a black person, face a situation where you have to look after two households. <laughs> the legacy of that lives today. 
and it's unaffordable. You have parents in the Cape, you are starting an economic life here, or you have parents in the north of Limpopo, or wherever, and you're starting an economic life here. You are certainly not going to be wealthy faster than any other really. Now, your parents have built a shop there. When they were passes away in 1902, they didn't live long, but he leaves the business to the wife. And the wife runs it where well, it doesn't go down yeah. until she passes on in the 1920s. Actually, I'm, I'm writing a paper on the black woman has always been CEO, but that's a story, wow. for, another, <laughs> that's a story for another day. Mom Eleanor Klinewa runs this thing, but she, when she dies, the concern doesn't continue to answer why. The other son is in Kimberley, the other one is in Johannesburg. Now this thing can't continue because children are scattered around and they are sitting, they are seeking better opportunities. Can you see what what that does? Um, it 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 really. Of course, we must also acknowledge certain instances where siblings also do not want to take responsibility, and um, it talks to succession planning. Mm -hmm. Now it's easy to talk to succession planning and say children were just poor, they were spoiled and irresponsible. But part of that succession planning is informed by the migrant labor patterns. Right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, let's give uh, both of them a big, yeah, I don't need it. Thank you very much. Uh, Paramisa, you put a point to, to add. Yeah, for my fellow African brothers that are here, the economic activity of black people is not special to South Africa. In the 1400s, there was a stock exchange in Mali. The Lemlem in Ghana were already in 580, were already trading in gold with Arabs. So the trading of black people in whatever commodities, hard and soft, is not unique to South Africa. Thank it you. was an African thing. I'm happy you raised yeah. it. Thank you. That is that is really wonderful. There's actually a seminar at Makerere, sorry. There's a seminar at Makerere this week. If anyone's interested on wealth and poverty in East Africa. Wow. Happening on Wednesday. That will be online as well. That is brilliant. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, any any questions, um, additions, subtractions, uh, any kind of mathematical intervention that people like to make? Well, it doesn't have to be mathematical. Uh, my brother, uh, um, are you online there? Are you connected? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, just pick up my brother. Uh, go ahead. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know if it's a question or comment. So, you know, we have the EFF, the speak about in the economy of our lifetime. Well, given like the, the stories that you shared with us that I saw like okay fine you explained that there's been laws prohibiting you know black people to try in business space be um, that other political parties see multiple in support of but like how would we envisage you know a, a, a time where black people are able to thrive in business if for instance, you have PE, but it's not properly managed. We understand um, this uh, legislation that is meant to help black people to try in business, but for some weird reason, that is not the case. Secondly, around the question of succession, I know we had this conversation, but we are using crisis chiefs. I think from all these stories that we are hearing, I think the succession is always not seen to be a problem mm. in black feminist, black business. So yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, let's take another question, maybe one or two. Uh, Dominic? <laughs> 
go for it, please. As you know, I, I, I don't really have a question, but I was, I was, uh, I was uh, kind of texting Ayanda, uh, but I did uh, also the comparison with, for example, with attacks on that block in the US and then the school in the US are trying to take two examples, right? And I had in mind, like new analysis of what happened in Tulsa, Oklahoma, for example, with the, the um, massacre and that Wall Street, etc. So I didn't have a question, but I was my mind was going there. <laughs> right. So if you have any uh, perspective, sure. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Pardon. Um, uh, Jamal's description uh, of the hotel was it on it was Amazon or on a different? Okay, so these three questions. Yeah, let's let's go for it. What you, my brother? It, it was on in for Zaban of June 13, 1894. I must say thank you to UCT though, because a huge portion of this book was done at the Yaga Library, at the Yaga Archives, and the copies of in for Zaban were there. Wow. At the you know that's that's Did where. You know, that yes, yeah. yes, yes, yes. But those. I'm told are safe yeah. in a microfilm in a microfilm format. So it was on him for in You know, in Tulsa, my sister Dominic, in Tulsa, there's something that I've been trying to do. Tulsa is this central business district in America that was designed by black people. It had everything. They I came across something they called the Zulu Lounge <laughs> in Tulsa. I'm still trying even today to find out who owned that Zulu lounge in Tulsa. So, so good, good observation there. Uh, Brother Don, you know, I want to start with the whole issue of BE. BE is not a program that was designed by black people as a start. Yeah. Uh, Please say that again uh, so that we hear you correctly. BE is not a program that was designed by black people. Um, I did a paper at VEDS titled, um, I think originated by HFF Mustard at the Apartheid Workshop. And this is how, by the 50s, you see there's something called a, a Tomlinson Commission in South Africa. Right. And the Fagan Commission before, and the Standard Commission before. All these commissions were concerned about the presence of black people yeah. in the urban areas. Yeah. And um, white people were uneasy with an increased presence of black people in the central business district. And what do they do? In the 50s, they enact a legislation called the Bantu Investment Corporation Act. And it gets effective mainly in the 60s. Um, actually, my next work touches on some people who were moved from Cape Town, who were entrepreneurs here, who are encouraged by the apartheid regime to go to the trans guy. And there is a Bantu investment corporation that is started in Pretoria. And this is what it does. The Nats or the National Party harboring wounds from the South African war or anglo war. You would recall that in the Cape, with the arrival of the settlers, there were trading stations. Right. Now, Pretoria, run by Nats, makes up this law and then says black people in cities must go to the reserves. They will take over English-owned businesses. And the English are forced to sell their businesses to this new native entity. Literally, Pretoria gives them money and says, we're going to give you so much, you will add your skin in the game. You are going to take over a white owned. Now, BE takes that form in 1994. This is something that has been happening in the 60s, right? To try and get black people away from the mainstream economic zone and to ease the tension. I mean, that is the first time I see equity related, that is shareholding in white businesses. 
in the 1990s when Nelson Mandela is released, okay, 1976 actually creates a big problem for the Nuts. Right. They do more of those deals. In for the Nuts. Nuts. No, 1976 is, is, a, is, is a headline grabbing attention. Right. They reinforce the homeland system, right. the independence yeah. Indep after 76. Indep and all these pseudo economies are created um, in the Bantustan. That is the first form of PE that I see. Right. Now, this is what happened in the 90s. They see that uh, black people are going to be responsible. I mean, they already knew by 1990 that the ANC is going to win. <laughs> and um, they start by identifying people who are closer to the incoming ruling elite. I mean, Dr. Ntato Mutlana was an entrepreneur before 1994, but he's identified by Sanlam, for example, um, and Sanlam sells Metropolitan to him. Before the design of the act yeah. in 1998. Right. So you really cannot expect um, Turkey to vote for Christmas. <laughs> it, it, it's just not going to happen. Um, BE was never yeah. created to aid, to really empower. Uh, you, you can't identify a black Oppenheimer in South Africa. 30 no. years. No, no, no. Actually, many people are exaggerated billionaires in this country. Right. Um, many of the so-called people that are called billionaires are not billionaires. Even when you read the annual reports they are where they are directors, you actually see how much of that is debt right. and how much is net. And, and, and you see that people are being made cartoons. Um, <laughs> Um, I mean, what, what is to be done? You know what the, what the ANC government tried to do and many other business people, they didn't want to throw away the baby with the bath. Whose baby? That is the nuts baby. Mm -hmm. Good question. Good question. <laughs> they said, well, we've seen in the homelands people taking their children to good schools and they become professionals, and they open up the economy. So they saw it as a as part of the struggle. And said, listen, better a quarter loaf of bread than nothing. We're going to move from a quarter loaf of bread and maybe we'll, we'll, we'll have the loaf right. one day. They try to sharpen it. They introduce skills development, enterprise and supplier development, and all these elements. Then established business starts squirming. Wow. No, 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 because the baby has now turned into a monster. Succession planning. It's very difficult, um, and I really don't want to take it lightly. Take Sim Chabalal. You know, he's done very well. He's a group CEO, I'm wrapping up. He's a group CEO of Standard Bank. He grows up in an entrepreneurial family in Soweto. Okay. Um, he's taken to a good school, Sacred Heart. He studies law. You know, he works hard to get mm -hmm. to where he is. Do you expect him? Personally, I think he played a bigger role in the economy than going back to a million rent turnover business or a 500,000 rent turnover business. So I'm saying, John, that when democracy arrived, it also opened up opportunities, yes. right? And those that were smart evolved, the families that were smart in business evolved from active operators of supermarkets to landlords. So they became landlords, for example, to your mass marts to your Yusufs, to Pakistanis, to Somalis, yeah. So, so there's a way of, you cannot force your child if they're interested in being a, a DJ and you, you, you want to force them to run a business. You, you can't, right? Or if they want to be a doctor, find another way, you know. But it teaches us though, in traditional societies, 
and, 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 and white people are very good at this. If Atambile is married at the Nzamenas, to the Nzamena, mm -hmm. she will be allowed, even as a Masola, to be a managing director of Nzamela Inc. Right. If we as the Nzamelas are not interested, if there's some yeah, argument, sure, sure. you know, that shows that sure. the business will be taken further. Sure. I think this whole notion of primogeniture, which doesn't exist in our right. culture, should stop. Right. If you want to first son, oh, okay. will take over. Ah, yeah. Uh, yeah, we need to deal with that. You must even take, you know, some families are even extreme. They will take a girlfriend of their son who is smart and they will say, you will run this based on trust and the skills that are there to take the business forward. I think we need to look at succession and the family can still control this thing in a shareholding format, but you are introducing management control, right? you know, that may be foreign to the family, but right. can take the business further. Right. But then Zamela Inc. must first exist for us as a viable, I mean, who, where are those companies, right, mm, mm. that are owned from start to finish mm. by black people? Sure. I mean, I mean, Maponya in my current work was going to be out soon. Right. I mean, the Maponyas have done seven decades of entrepreneurship wow. um, from the 50s. And Maponya knows they are, knew the abilities and the disabilities of the children. Mm -hmm. He partners and his own abilities. He partnered with Zencrop and established property development right. to build Maponya. That's correct. When he did that, he immortalized his name That's for the correct. next 50 years. That's correct. You know, yeah. so, 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 so. so it's Maponya and? <clears throat> E.T. You know, E.T.'s family, they've just renewed you can count them, it's not a lot. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Let's be I honest. Right? I, I concede. Yeah. I concede. Yeah. It's very rare that you get black families running seven decades. Yeah. You know, it's, 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 yeah. it's really rare. Thank you. I mean, uh, I must declare my loyalties to Alan the Pirates, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but we must be very respectful to Babu Down, uh, his achievements. So, so thank you so much. Um, Native merchants is available, uh, you know, in case certain people would like to purchase a copy. Uh, <laughs> so we can buy a few native merchants. I'm not thought of buying native merchants, but here we go. Uh, so, so, so thank you so much. Uh, and also on Thursday, we have another seminar, uh, an entire seminar uh, that is uh, moderated by, by my dear sister, Dominique Samdo. We've got uh, Leon Chikli, or I hope I say that right. He's the UNESCO Chair on, on Transforming Knowledge uh, and Research in, in a, for Just and Sustainable Futures. Uh, he's from the University of Bristol. So this is happening this Thursday. So please join us uh, okay. on Thursday. Oh, one o'clock, one o'clock to two o'clock. All our seminars at Huma are, are lunchtime seminars so that, uh, yeah. And I know that uh, we're about to close. And then uh, next week on Monday, we're hosting Anais uh, Menard. She's a professor. She, she's uh, uh, actually, I'm possibly wrong if I say she's a professor, but she is from the um, Max Planck Institute of Social Anthropology. And she'll be uh, talking about her book on uh, Sierra Leone. Uh, wonderful uh, work it is also available online integrating strangers uh, you know so so we'll have that on monday uh, here um, and um, yeah i don't know what else uh, i've left out uh, you know i thank everybody uh, who's here and who's talking with us and of course our speakers were just prolific wonderful in so many ways uh, let's give them another round of applause Yeah. Only about 30 seconds. I really want to maximize um, and, Sunday and, there. Yeah. You know, and I thank my colleagues as well, sure. Joy and the uh, and, and, and sure. Ascension. Thank you. You know, and, and thanks for hosting. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, you. You know, we must also be friends. Some of the businesses that were in the townships that were black owned, 
they do not exist today because they really did not have proper business fundamentals. When the economy opened up in 1994, they really could not compete. They only competed because black people were closed right. into the reserves and, and they were forced to shop there. And at high prices, we must also be honest that they were put in a corner to sell at prices that were more expensive than your outfitter or retailer on the central business district. I thought I should highlight that. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. See, Abulela, uh, thank you so much to everybody. See you soon. Uh, thank you so much. That was quick and fast. I know.